This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the Weekly Top 3, our weekly podcast covering the top three things on our mind as we start into the week of April 9th, 2018. The Weekly Top 3 is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The Michael Duke Show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 9 to 11 a.m. I join Michael on the show each each Tuesday morning from 9.15 to 10 for a discussion between the two of us about the three issues. We post the podcast of our discussions following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and also on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us on these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, the battle in the legislature over PFD cuts. Second, what it will take to really reduce state government spending. And third, oil taxes and credits. And now, let's join Michael. Keithley joins us every week to discuss oil, gas, and the economic forecast of Alaska. It's the Michael Dukes Show. Brad Keithley. Good morning, my friend. How are you, sir? What's happening? Michael, I'm doing great. How are you today? You know, I'm doing good. Yesterday I had a little bit of a barn burner and uh it was uh I mean, we were really we were really lashing it around yesterday and uh today it's uh, I'm feeling pretty good about it. So uh, I know you got your top three for the week that we're going to talk about, but first, I just want, did you get a chance to watch those videos of the of the two different meetings last week from the one that I just played and uh, from the Saturday meeting? Oh, I did. Oh, I did, yeah. <laughs> I had just never seen a grown man throw a temper tantrum uh, so bad. I mean, somebody just does not like being stymied or thwarted. Well, yeah, I... John has John has shown a side of himself that that others have talked about in the past, but I had actually never seen until uh, come out uh, until this session. I, I, I will say this: he didn't break the the handle of off the, the gavel, gavel. <laughs> <laughs> but it was close. <laughs> you heard it squeak. It was it was, <laughs> it, it was emphatic, um, and. And he did it twice. I mean, so there's the Wednesday segment, and then there's the uh, then there's the Saturday segment where he uh, where he did it again. Yeah, I want to know what they make those gavels out of because that that could be like bulletproof armor for our troops or something. That's good stuff. Um, so let's talk a little bit about your weekly top three. I mean, we're, we're we appear to be. I mean, Nat Hur is talking about things being paralyzed and everything else. Um, down there but there's still i mean we've still got the battle it's still going on it's a battle over the pfd is what we're looking at right now uh what are your thoughts on it well i the pfd uh we we sort of hit the high water mark for this session on the pfd when the house uh voted uh on the floor to um uh reestablish the pfd at the at the statutory at the statutory level of 2700 we're we're it's gone downhill since uh when the house reversed that vote and then reduced it to 1600 uh and now it's gone over to the senate and the senate to some degree surprisingly has has put in 1600 as well the senate's um uh proposed uh permanent fix sb26 would would have a substantially reduced PFD even from that, uh, but they appear to have adopted the House PFD for purposes, at least for purposes right now, um, of the of the budget. But but what's really interesting, I'll get back to the uh, this story comes back to the PFD in a second. But what's really interesting is what's going on in the budget generally, um, and how that plays into the PFD. You'll recall last session that the Senate talked a lot about, we're gonna cut the budget this year, 
this is last year. We're going to cut the budget this year, and then we're going to cut it more next year, and we're going to cut it more the year after that. We're going to we're going to bring it down substantially uh, through through these phase cuts over the three years, and made and made a big deal about the, right. about that last year. When you look at the budget this year, I just posted that up on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets uh, Facebook uh, page. When you when you look at the Senate budget this year. Not only have they not made those cuts, but when you look at general fund spending, which is what I, I sort of have gravitated to now over time to to wash out the effects of, of these accounting tricks that they've used to move money between uh, unrestricted general funds, UGF, and, and, and designated general funds, DGF. When you look at total general fund spending, not only has the Senate not made reductions uh, this year, they actually have increased the, the proposal before Senate finance right now. They've actually increased spending uh, over what the House proposed, and the House increased it over what the governor proposed. So <laughs> the Senate, I mean, what's really going on with the budget uh, is that is that we're having increases um, uh, now year on year, uh, not only in the House, but now when you look at the Senate. Uh, well, that's going on in the Senate. What that does, and this gets back to the PFD, what that does is create the necessity for new revenues. I mean, if you're not going to cut the budget, if you're not going to reduce spending, then you have to have revenues uh, in order to avoid just digging yourself even deeper into the hole. And that's the pressure behind the PFD cuts. Um, the fa The failure of not only the House, not not just the governor, but the failure of the Senate, the rock ribbed, we're the guys who are going to die in the trenches, we're the ones who are going to make the cuts. The failure of the Senate, uh, not only not only to make cuts, but the failure of the Senate even to hold the line on what the House is sending over to them. So that's that's the big story behind the PFD. The the yes, I mean, what's going on with the PFD level is important. But what's really more important uh, from the standpoint of the PFD is the failure of both bodies, uh, but the Senate in particular, since they were the ones out there saying they were going to do it, the failure of both bodies uh, to hold the line uh, on spending. Well, and that's part of the problem. That's what we've been talking about, you know, this whole time is that there is this appetite for the dollars that nobody seems to want to curb back. Uh, Shelly Hughes did a little video quick clip yesterday where she talked specifically about what you're just talking about, 3% increase in overall spending on the Senate side, 11% in UGF spending. I mean, and again, this is on a bill that the House already had their fingers in and increased spending by, it was 11, well, how much, how many, it, was a, it was a pretty big jump over what the governor wanted, uh, mi millions of dollars. Well well, the House, uh, and, and these are all before PFD numbers, and these are general fund numbers, again, because right. they, they've, they've gotten so, so into these tricks about moving money between categories to, uh, to, to, to limit uh, or, to, or to make things look smaller than they really are. Um, the, the House increase over the budget was roughly 2%, 1.9% uh, general fund spending before the PFD. Uh, and the Senate is a 0.2% increase over that. Well, again, there just seems to be, as you said, no political will, no interest. It's like, well, we're here. We've set the conversation. We're just going to go ahead and cut the dividends, and then we'll spend what we want anyway. And if we need more, we'll increase our draw percentage. That's what it seems to be the – that seems to be the motivation at this point. It does. And, and, you know, you get people like Chris Birch now who are out there saying or who said earlier this session that he doesn't mind. I mean, he's 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 prepared to take the PFD down to zero um, uh, in order to avoid taxes. So, you know, they're looking at another six hundred million dollars, um, seven hundred million dollars of additional revenue. If, if you take that attitude that you can take the PFD to zero. They're looking at another seven hundred million dollars of additional revenue they can draw on um, uh, from cutting the cutting the PFD further. It, it's it we, we have lost the legislature government has lost the will uh, to to reduce spending further. We're seeing we're, we're seeing upticks now 
and we're not seeing reductions. There's a hearing in House Finance today. I was just going over the calendar before I before I joined you on the program. There's a hearing in House Finance today to to review um, uh, increases in the BSA in the base student allowance uh, right. that 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 funds. Uh, K through 12, and you know you see the the usual mantra about oh my gosh for the kids the class sizes are too huge, we need to get we need to get funding up, you know we need to have more teachers, we need to reduce class size. Um, we, all the pressures now that you're seeing on both on both sides uh, are to are to increase spending, um, and and that that tells you a lot about. Uh, about where the future is headed, uh, and it tells you a lot about why the PFD is uh, being cut. Yesterday, um, somebody posted to your Facebook page uh, commentary on the on the uh, on the uh, PFD, and I responded with a quote from the Alaska Permanent Fund Board, basically saying that you know because his his assertion was that the the PFD is a welfare check. Essentially, it's a government expense. <laughs> it's welfare. It's a handout. He didn't want to be. He didn't want to be. Uh, uh, convinced otherwise, uh, and I don't. I don't know why he continues the the battle, but it made me go back, and I actually, I actually went back and started reading Diapering the Devil again, and Hammond, mm-hmm. Hammond was prescient. I mean, he really was, because I mean, nothing ever changes. It, there's nothing new under the sun. History repeats itself, and he could see what was going to happen if politicians got unfettered access to the fund itself, to the to the earnings reserve, to all these things. And he could see what was coming down the pike, and this is it. This is exactly what he feared when it all came down, was that government would essentially take the vast majority of what was in the earnings and then squander the PFD, or the, the, not only the PFD, but the permanent fund itself. And I think that's, I think that's in the cards, quite honestly. Well, if you don't, if you can't get yourself, if, if you can't get yourself restrained in these times especially, Right, in 2018. Right, given given what the state of Alaska is facing, if you can't get yourself positioned to reduce spending, if you if you can't even get yourself positioned to hold the line, um, if if what the result of your work is, looking at the Senate finance sheet, if what the result of your work is is even additional increases, um, yeah, we're we're uh, Alaska is. Is is facing a crossroads, and and we're going, to, and and all the government, uh, the governor, house, and senate now are going down the road of well, we can't cut any more, and we're going to have to increase. We need revenue for that, and so we're going to pull the revenue uh, from the permanent fund. And and as you and I have talked about uh, on uh, on previous occasions, that started two years ago when they changed the wording, they changed the classification. Uh, that you put the permanent fund dividend into. It was no longer this separate side account uh, that, that that got added into the budget sort of at the end uh, in conformance with the statute. All of a sudden, two years ago, it got moved over. Uh, those revenues got moved over to unrestricted general fund, and all of a sudden, uh, the permanent fund dividend started being, you know, uh, uh, another government spending program that that needed to be that needed to be cut. It's we're we're going down a track where we're making Alaska government <laughs> more powerful. We're giving more money to Alaska government. We're taking money out of the private sector and pushing it into Alaska government. Um, and and given uh, the way the PFD operates, that is, I did a calculation earlier this week. Cutting the PFD to the to the to the top twenty percent of Alaskans is the equivalent per person of less than the cost of a Starbucks a day. So we, 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 the way the PFD is structured is the top 20% doesn't care. I mean, it's, yeah, okay, less than a Starbucks, okay. But, you know, we're talking about a, a revenue that's, that's 8% to middle-income Alaskans, 30% to low-income Alaskans, uh, and, and we're cutting that away. But the, but the fact that top 20% doesn't feel it, that it's less than the Starbucks, means they're not putting pressure on government to stop stop government spending. Yeah, okay, take the PFD. That's fine. Take everybody else's PFD. That's fine. We don't really care. We want to keep spending. Uh, we want to keep the, these spending levels up. And so that's the direction Alaska government's going pulling the money out of the private sector through the PFD as they go. Well, and that's what exactly what Hammond warned about. He warned that the people will 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 want you know the the tax 
is the pain that makes the government, uh, you know, that, that, that makes people aware of what government is doing. The higher the taxes, the more people resist. And because we have no taxes right now, and I'm not advocating a tax, I'm saying this is what Hammond, this is why he was so upset when they eliminated instead of just turn the tax to zero, it just eliminated the income tax because he says, you don't understand. This is the only thing that will keep government in check is that as they turn up the taxes because they need the money as the revenues decline, you'll see exactly how much your government is costing you and you will take a stand and say no. Um, and that's part of the problem is, is part of the problem is the way it's set up in the state of Alaska. We don't see the revenue. We don't see the oil wealth. We don't see it directly. Instead, it all goes to the government and government bloats up and we never actually have to put it in our pocket and then pull it back out of our pocket to pay it. And that's a real problem. We're disconnected from the actual cost of our government until now. And now we're starting to see it. The question is, can we win this battle over the PFD? Uh, you know, is it going to make a big enough difference with people? Yeah, and we're seeing it. I mean, the the, 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 the issue with PFD cuts is they don't affect all Alaskans the same, right? Um, lower income Alaskans see 30% of their income disappear. A family of four earn the average income in the lower income bracket sees 30% of their income disappear when the PFD cuts. Middle income Alaskans average a family of four earning the Average level of income in the middle income bracket sees eight percent of their uh, of their of their uh, uh, income disappear, but the upper income bracket only sees you know less than two percent, one point seven percent of their of their income uh, disappear. An average family of four, a family of four earning the average income in the upper income bracket only sees one point seven percent. So, we're, we're Alaskans aren't seeing the effect of this equally, and the Alaskans. The segment of the Alaska population that has the most impact, the most ability to affect legislators, the most ability to affect uh, what legislation is going, the upper income bracket, the donor class, those who who support, those who whose calls are returned when they when they call <laughs> legislators, they're seeing they're seeing the least effect. Right. Absolutely. And and that's and that's the that's the problem. Now you're talking about taking the rest of the dividend, taking it to zero. So instead of a 30% cut to the low class, it would be a 60%. I mean, we're talking about a significant amount of money for a lot of these people pushing, what, what do we say, 8% below the poverty line? And if we keep doing that, then all that's left is the, you know, the, the it's pushing everybody down towards the poverty line. Yeah, it's 12, uh, kind of $1,000 in the PFD increases poverty levels, according to ICER. By twelve to fifteen thousand Alaskans, which is about two percent of the population. So, two percent of the population. I mean, the sustained thousand dollar cut that we're having in the PFD over the, now the last two and likely now the third year is is pushing two uh, percent uh, of the overall population. That's a huge number, actually, when you talk about right uh, uh, poverty levels. Pushing two percent of the overall population below poverty levels. If you talk about continuing to take additional amounts out of the PFD. And to go back to John Coghill for a second, I mean, that's that's Coghill's objection as he articulated it uh, on on Saturday. That's Coghill's objection uh, to putting the PFD in the Constitution. Uh, I mean, his argument was, well, geez, I mean, it's not available for government spending then. We, we, it'll take money off the table that we may need for government spending. I, it, it's, I mean, that's what wow. they wanted there. They want yeah. the PFD there. It's sort of, it's sort of like the next constitutional budget reserve, right? Right. Or is it, we used, we used to have the statutory budget reserve, the constitutional budget reserve, and, and we blew through both those. The legislature blew through both those because they weren't willing to put limits on, uh, on spending. And now the PFD, frankly, is being viewed by many, uh, and particularly people like Hoghill and Senate Republicans, as the next constitutional budget reserve. Yeah, we really shouldn't be doing this. We really don't want to be doing this. But, you know, we got to spend money on schools. We got to spend money on the university. And we got to spend money on this and that and the other thing. And then the PFD is state funds anyway. And so we'll just sort of treat it like the next pot of money that we're going to that we're going to go blow through before we before we actually start really getting serious. We'll get serious. Someday. We've, we've got to make those hard choices. Just stick with us. We got to make those hard choices for you. <laughs> yeah, we'll make those hard choices five years from now when we've blown through the yeah. we've blown through the PFD. I, the, the point of this is the Senate, as it's currently constituted, 
I mean, John Coghill may be, I, I wrote a piece uh, uh, or, a, or a comment, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, but, but John Coghill may be, you look at him one way, he's sort of a double agent, right? I mean, he's telling you that the Republicans are incapable of, 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 of maintaining the, of making the hard decisions, making the cuts necessary uh, to, to keep the PFD and to, and to keep Alaska spending down. And he's frankly making the case for, you know, give somebody else a chance then if the, right. if the Republicans can't, can't control this. Well, and that's exactly it. I mean, these folks, if these folks can't do the job and let's face it, the vast majority of these people have been there for more than 10 years. Uh, they are part of the problem. And if you think the people that got you here are going to be able to get you out, history shows that that is normally not the case. Uh, before we move off of this topic, Ron in the chat room says, wait, Machiki says he has cut the budget $300 million. So how is it possible that the Senate is actually increasing their spend? Can you give us a lesson in mathematics? <laughs> Well, go to the Facebook page, look at the page I posted up there, which is from Legislative Finance, and it will show you how they're doing that. Uh, you know, they will say some of it, some of it's not their fault. They will say <laughs> the, House un the House underfunded oil and gas tax credits, and so we needed to, we need to increase spending uh, in order to offset what the House did to underfund oil and gas tax credits. Okay, I'll, I'll sort of give you that. But you said last year, Senate, that you were going to find another two to to three hundred million dollars in additional cuts, and we all knew that oil and gas tax credits were going to be there again this year. You haven't you haven't found any of those. Uh, you found some um, some minor ones, frankly, and and maybe what Machiki's claim is. I found some. I found if you'd only look at the cuts we made, here's some cuts we made. Um, uh, but the problem is the ad backs are, are outweighing the cuts. So the, the numbers are on that sheet I've got on, uh, on the Alaska for sustainable budgets, Facebook page. You can, you can, you can look for yourself where those increases are. Uh, but, um, but overall, when you look at general fund spending, which is again, because of the accounting tricks where you need to look at these days, uh, overall, the Senate spending is up. It's, uh, it's pretty amazing. I mean, the, the permutations, I think you have to be the human contortionist to be able to follow all these arguments sometimes when it comes out of this legislature. So, I mean, here's the thing. There's no, there's no interest. There's no interest politically in making this happen. The people want it, it seems like. I mean, anecdotally, out on the street, when I'm talking to business owners, when I'm talking to the vast majority of Alaskans, they are all for it. I mean, because they are all tightening their belts. I mean, I've tightened my belt, obviously, being unemployed, and everybody around me is like, you know, pulling the pulling the, the strings tighter. But the legislature just seems to have no interest. So, what is it going to really take to reduce spending? Well, I you were quoted Governor Hammond earlier, and I think um, I think Governor Hammond, as you say, was prescient. Uh, uh, he. Either he or his advisors, uh, I think, really understood, uh, really deeply understood the Alaska economy and, and the motivations of Alaskans, uh, even though it was many years ago. It still it still resonates uh, in terms of what it what it takes. Hammond said um, the best quote, the best therapy for containing malignant government growth is a diet forcing politicians to spend no more than that for which they are willing to tax. And, and my my. My take on that was, I said, put another way, if you want to motivate Alaskans to focus on actually reducing spending rather than just paying lip service to that objective, tell them they will be taxed to pay for it if they don't constrain spending. And, and that's, I think that's what it's going to take. The PFD, is I, it, the problem with the PFD is acting as a constraint on spending is, is it doesn't hit all Alaska brackets income brackets equally it it's the cost as i said earlier is the cost uh less than a cost than the cost of a starbucks uh to uh to the top 20 percent um uh of alaskans and so they don't really they don't really feel it it's like yeah okay you know k through 12 that's important let's continue spending there well, it's not going to really cost me because we're going to take it out of the out of the pfd um and so i'm okay with that Right. And as I said earlier, that's that's the income bracket that the legislators legislators listen to. So the PFD cut is not acting as a constraint um, on government spending. We're seeing that 
uh, through the actions of what's going on in the legislature right now. We've got to do something else uh, to get uh, to 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 create a motivation to control spending. We and 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 again, I think you and I have have exhausted this, but let me just do it one more time. You and I are not in favor of a tax per se, but we understand that they have shifted the conversation so far off the off the playing field that we're actually out in the ditches somewhere and they've decided that no matter what they need more revenue because you and I have argued that this is really not a revenue problem an income problem this is a spending problem but because they refuse to address that they're going to find the income wherever they can and at this point we're looking for the you know the the least worst revenue generation system that we can find yeah, exactly right. I mean, we, I, you and I both have conversations with people. We have exchanges with people on Facebook and elsewhere uh, almost daily about no tax, no PFD cut, just cut spending. Well, I mean, we've, how many years – I've been at this, at this particular issue since 2012. What is that, six years now? Yep. I, I wrote the first, my first piece on, on the time to cut spending is now, uh, appeared in the in, – in, in, I, yeah, it was still the Anchorage Daily News then before it became something else and then went back. It, it appeared in the Anchorage Daily News in 2012, October 2012. The time to cut spending has come. Um, we've been, I've been at it for six years. Uh, some have been at it for much longer. It's not happening. I mean, you, all you have to do is look at the, at the sheet on what the Senate's proposing for their budget, and you see uh, it's not happening. We can talk about it. I mean, th- this, this circle... Uh, of people, circle of friends that you and I have that say no tax, no PFD cut, cut spending. We we can talk about it till we're blue in the face. The legislature just isn't doing it. I mean, yes, the Matsu, which is where a lot of our friends are, um, uh, still believes that, and the Matsu delegation uh, votes that way. But that's only three senators and and six representatives, six out of forty. And actually, one of the senators doesn't even vote that way. So it's only two senators um, out of out of twenty uh, in the Senate that are that are holding on that. The rest of the delegations, the rest of the state is voting to to increase spending. I mean, just look at the Senate. And uh, and so it's time to face facts. It's time. It, it, basically, I mean, it's time to get on the field. Right. The people who are arguing. Uh, we don't have to have a PFD cut. We don't have to have uh, taxes. Are f- frankly standing on the sidelines of where the debates really really occurring. Right. Uh, the debates really occurring about what uh, really occurring about what type of revenue we're going to go to. Um, because they're standing off to the sidelines, I think they'd probably be the ones that say PFD cuts last, just like you know good economists say, because it has the harshest impact on the overall economy. But but. But the ones that are standing off to the sideline are letting the people who are on the field make the decision. And frankly, the ones on the field are making the decision right now to, to, to raise those revenues through PFD cuts. Right. It's like the people on the field are the one that are making up the game rules as they go along. And the people on the sidelines don't even know what game they're playing at this point because that ship has sailed. The ship of cutting more will fix the problem has sailed because you do not have the political will in the legislature. And I hate to say that because I've been beating this drum for 15 years and 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 I've been beating the same drum for 15 years and nobody has had the balls to go up there and make the cuts and deliver the bad news that, hey, I'm sorry we can't give you your pet program, but we just don't have the money, or in the future we won't have the money, and we're worried about it. We're draining our savings, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's just it's not a it's not a reality right now. It's not a possibility of simply cutting our way. We could if we had the will, but we don't. So it, it, it so that's off the table. Let's find the least painful yeah, method so, to make it happen. Yeah. So the question is the question then is how do you create the will? And, and, and you go back to Hammond's quote and, and just common sense that the best, best therapy for containing malignant government growth is a diet forcing politicians to spend no, no more than that for which they're willing to tax. You say you want more government spending. You, all Alaskans, are going to pay for it. Now, the advocates of the PFD cuts say, well, all Alaskans are paying for it, um, uh, you know, through PFD cuts. And, and they're OK with that. The ones we listen to are okay with that, so we're going to continue spending. The problem is 
the disproportionate effects and 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 the people who are paying the least uh, for for the cost of those increased governments, the donor class are the ones that have the most influence. The approach that that I think works a lot better, the approach that I think implements uh, Hammond's uh, uh, vision better than any other is a flat tax. I've got I wrote a piece on that this week. Uh, a link to it is up on the Alaskans for Sustainable uh, Budgets Facebook page. The title of it is. Uh, want to really control state spending, use a flat tax. The reason I think a flat tax works best is it because it affects all Alaskans proportionately. If you calculate the amount, if you use a flat tax to calculate the amount of revenue that the Senate wants to raise through PFD cuts, the flat tax would be about 2.6%, 2.77%. You hit all Alaskans with that uh, uh, equally. So they all then have have skin in the game. Those in the in the top 10%, top 20%, it's no longer less than the cost of a Starbucks. Uh, it's 2.7% uh, of their income. Those in the lower income class, it's 2.7% of their income. If you start hitting Alaskans with the taxes, as Hammond envisioned, if you start hitting Alaskans with the tax, then I think they're going to wake up. And I think they're going to say, wait a second, you mean I have to pay for, for oil and gas tax credits, I have to pay for uh, in, increases in K through 12 spending. No, I don't want to, I don't want you to take any more of my income to do that. Legislator, uh, uh, pay attention now. I want you to actually go in there and reduce costs. It's no longer less than the cost of a Starbucks. It's something material to me. I want you to stop that. As it and and by hitting all income classes equally, you don't get. What you sometimes get is the flip side effect if you use a pro progressive income tax. A progressive income tax takes virtually all the funding out of the top 25, or out of the top 20 percent, the top 30 percent, and the bottom segment doesn't doesn't pay much. So with that, if you use a progressive income tax, and the bottom segment says, "Hey, it doesn't cost me anything more. Give me more government programs. Give me more right. free stuff because I don't have to pay for it." The advantage of a flat tax is it hits all Alaskans the same. All Alaskans have the same stake um, uh, in government spending. They all contribute the same toward government spending, and they all then have the same incentive uh, to bring uh, uh, spending down. From, the, from the, the richest Alaskan to the poorest Alaskan, they all have the same uh, consequence of, uh, of, of additional government spending. And I think that is, going back to Hammond, I think that is – that is where we need to go. If you truly want to constrain government spending, as opposed to send, standing off to the sideline and say, saying, oh, God, bring spending down, and sort of shouting into this echo chamber that, that the legislature is not paying attention to, if you truly want to bring government spending down, then start talking about forcing Alaskans to pay for it uh, if the government does increase government spending. And I bet that conversation but my, my view is that conversation will change a lot. Because there is a difference in, you know, something that you just didn't get and something that you have to pay. I mean, that there really is. I mean, Milton Friedman was kind of a genius on the withholding tax because prior to that, you know, you had to pay and people, you know, would have really gotten upset if they just had never seen the money to begin with. So you start talking about taking these taxes where people have to write a check to the government or something else. I mean, it's a significant it's a significant change. All of a sudden, the pain will be on them. But I think James in the chat room makes a uh, makes a comment here that I think is also important to know. It's going to take a strong governor to cut spending because he's the guy that's got his hand on the tiller. I mean, the legislature makes their decisions. They can go up or down. But the governor himself is really the starting point of any strong, uh, you know, any kind of movement on the budget. And that's really part of the change that needs to happen as well, is that we need a strong governor who is dedicated to reducing the size and scope of government. Yeah, I, I think I think that's a that's a part of it. But you've got to get the legislator motiv legislature motivated also. The legislature can override a governor. They can override governor, a governor's line item veto. The governor is going to want things out of the legislature. The legislature is going to use their appropriations power as a counterbalance to that. Yes, a strong governor could be very helpful. But thinking that we're going to have a man on a white horse uh, ride in here and able to get government spending under control when neither the Senate nor the House 
uh, is motivated to do that. And when the donor class is not motivated to do that, uh, thinking that we're going to have a strong governor come in here on a white horse and do that, I, I think is, is being um, unrealistic. I think that's, I think that's just another way, frankly, of standing, standing over on the sidelines. We have got to get something that motivates all Alaskans, not only, not only the middle class who I think are already motivated. If you look at who's really talking about PFD issues, it's mostly middle class, middle and lower income uh, class Alaskans. We've got to get something that motivates all Alaskans to get involved in this conversation. And, and taxing all Alaskans, or the threat of a tax, let's say that because that's what Hammond said, the threat of a tax uh, that, that distributes across the board doesn't give one income bracket the ability to shove costs over on another income bracket. Um, a threat, that threat of a tax, I think, gets Alaskans uh, in the game in a way that, that they just haven't been as we've blown through the statutory budget reserve, as we've blown through the constitutional budget reserve, and as we now treat the PFD as sort of the next in line of these, quote, savings accounts uh, that the legislature raids. So <clears throat> part of the other problem, and one of the reasons why we got here, of course, is because, well, quite honestly, it's because politicians for years, and not just this legislator, not this, these people, but groups prior to them, have continually, <clears throat> excuse me, kicked the can down the road. Like you said, they drain the statutory, they drain the CBR, they're looking to drain the, the ERA. I mean, they, they have no fiscal discipline and in fact, they look for outs as to how not to have to pay something now to pay it later. And of course, paying it later always costs us more money. And we talk about this and then they come up with wonky ideas like bonding for PERS and TERS debt and all these <laughs> other things. But I mean, this is this is a pattern. And we're seeing this not just at the state level also, but at the national level. But this kick the can down the road itis is really taking us down someplace where we will be on a fiscal cliff. And I mean, oil and tax credits are a perfect example. They are a perfect example. Great segue into oil and gas tax credits. So, so we have this issue that we have about a billion dollars, 800 million to a billion dollars in accumulated oil and gas tax credits that are owed over time, according to the statute, owed over time uh, to uh, uh, certain oil and gas companies that came in and performed certain activities that the state agreed to subsidize. And, and this 800 to a, to a billion dollars sort of is sitting out there. The oil and gas, the statute, the current statute, the statute in the way that it's been there since the beginning of the program says we pay you out over time. We pay you essentially as we have the revenue. If our oil and gas tax, uh, production tax levels are high or revenues are high, we'll pay you a lot. Uh, if they're if they're low as they have been for the last four years because of reduced oil prices and and moderate falls in uh, in production, and then we'll pay you less. We'll we'll pay you a percentage out of what we have. We don't owe you any more than what we have. That was those were the rules of the game back in 2007 and 2008 when this program began. Now that we've gotten here, now that that risk of a drop in revenues has matured as a result of the drop in oil prices, producers have been have been out there claiming you know, these oil and gas companies have been out there claiming, oh my gosh, well we never we never thought that was going to happen. So we you owe us all this money and we want it now. You know the, I, we know the statute pr <laughs> uh, uh, provides that it will be paid out over time, but we want it now. And 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 for whatever reason, the governor has bought into that uh, and has said, well yeah, we want to give that all to you now. Um, we don't have the money, so how else can we come up with it? And the idea is to go out and issue these bonds, raise a bunch of money, you know, issue bonds, the state, a state IOU that will pay you later to bondholders, get a bunch of money in, pay that over to the producers, and then the state stuck with the debt, stuck with, stuck with the bonds. Um, the, the net effect of that um, is to reduce current costs now. The way they're structuring these bonds is to get a bunch of money in the door, pay it over to the producers, and then pay and then structure the bonds so that we pay them out uh, over a much longer period of time than the statute other, otherwise provides. Instead, for example, instead of owing producers $180 million this year, uh, as we do under the statute, the state would only have to appropriate $25 million. We get all these bonds in, we pay all the money over to the producers, but we'd only have to pay, the state would only have to pay $25 million. But as with bonds, as with debt, 
you got to pay it sometime. Right. And, <clears throat> and what, what, and what the approach does is stretch out the repayment obligation out to 2030 um, and pushes, kicks the can of these obligations from the state's standpoint down the road. The state justifies that by saying, oh, we'll have more revenues in the future. And, and so we'll be better able to pay off these bonds. The same approach, they're using the same approach with respect to PERS and TERS payments. If you look at where PERS and TERS is going, we've kicked the can down the road. The current payment isn't coming close to covering uh, uh, the costs we should be covering. We've just, we, we've got a bulge that we're building up uh, out there in future years. And so, and so we're making the problem worse. I mean, same thing Congress is doing by, by taking the nation deeper into national debt. We're just pushing the, the problem down uh, to the next generation. We got to face up to some of this stuff. It's not going to get better. Revenues aren't going to get better uh, in the future. You can't count on revenues getting better in the future. All you're doing is you're trying to cover up. It's another accounting trick to try to cover up the true costs uh, of government currently by kicking kicking the can down the road to future generations. This generation, in my opinion, this generation needs to face up to its responsibilities, address those responsibilities, and 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 timely resolve those responsibilities and not push it off on our kids and grandkids like we're doing with PERS and TERS and like we're proposing to do with the oil and gas tax credit program. Well, and let's talk for just a second about how, uh, and, and, and I agree with you 100%, my entire show yesterday was dedicated to this idea because it's math. I mean, you cannot continue. If you're in a hole, the first thing you do is stop digging. You don't just say, toss me another shovel, we're going to go twice as fast and get out of this. I mean, you just stop digging, but we're not doing that. We're just, we're just put, you know, putting the coal to it and say, we're going we're gonna to make it happen. My question is, because the oil companies, I mean, you and I have had this discussion before, <clears throat> they've got rooms and floors full of buildings full of lawyers who look at every contract they ever signed, everything that they ever did, Saying that the oil companies didn't know, had no idea that this could be paid out over time, is so disingenuous it makes my my eyes bleed. But now they're saying, now the governor somehow has bought into this to say, oh, we need to pay it back now. But that's not what the statute says. So yet we have, we have yet another statute that they are going to just ignore and indebt us and cause us to spend more money in the future over what we've got going on right now. Yeah, exa exactly right. It's you know you know what the what the companies what the companies focus on um, uh, when when they say oh you promised to pay us more now and and no company has sued. I mean the real the real test of whether they truly believe this is a legal obligation is whether they've sued. No company has sued. If if anybody believed the state really owed this money. They would sue. Believe me, that's what I spent 30 years of my life doing. Um, uh, they would sue, but no company is sued because they know there's not a legal obligation there. What they what they use is a cartoon that was to, to make this claim is is a cartoon that was in some materials that Dan Sullivan, now Senator Dan Sullivan, but when he was Commissioner of Revenue, Dan Sullivan used at some trade shows. That would that I think it's a moose that has a talking moose saying in this cartoon, a talking moose saying, Alaska will have your back. Alaska will be there every step of the way and back you up uh, on these on these uh, drilling programs. Well, I mean, even those materials reference the statute. And if you went and read the statute, it was absolutely clear that Alaska's <laughs> obligation was defined by a percent of of the production tax revenues that we had. If those product, production tax revenues were high, we'd pay out a lot. If the production tax revenues were low, we would pay less. That was absolutely clear in the statute. The, the cart, even the cartoon uh, uh, sheet referenced that. But it's this cartoon that's driving everybody to say, oh my God, we owe the producers all this money. We need to find some way to pay it now. Um, you know, As you said, ignoring yet another fiscal statute uh, to try to find ways to shovel money out the door. But it's at the expense of having to pay more later. Future Alaskans having to pay an obligation that really is a debt incurred by this generation of, of, of Alaskans 
Um, and, and unless we just want to keep rolling this problem more and more down the hill, making the ball bigger and bigger and bigger, the snowball bigger and bigger and bigger as it, as it rolls, we need to stop some of this stuff. Um, and this is a perfect place to do it, to stop, to say, no, we're going to, we're going to face up to our obligations as defined by the statute now. Uh, but they're only going to be the obligations defined by the statute. We're not going to go get ourselves further in debt to shovel out a bunch of money uh, to producers before the op- before the time the obligation is due. And and end up paying a lot more money and, you know, again, bonding things for PERS and TERS debt and all this other kind of stuff. I mean, it, it truly is accounting insanity. It's it's Hail Mary passes and they dress it up in pretty language and make you swallow it and say, this is we're doing the right thing for you and uh, it's not working. So. All this said and done, Brad, we've just laid out all the fine details. Like I said, if yesterday was the 10,000-foot view, this was the electron microscope view, uh, which I enjoy. I don't know if everybody else does, but I enjoy it. Um, where, What do we do, Brad? What I mean, what with all this going on and everything happening, what do we do now? How do we, how do we make these things – how do we make these dreams become reality? Well, I, there's a couple of things we we need to. You and I have talked about in previous programs. We need to change out the players. Uh, we need to change out the people who are making these decisions. But more important than that, I think we need to bring people who are standing off to the sideline who are saying, "Oh no, we're going to solve this through these through these budget cuts that the legislature is not doing. Not even the Senate is doing. We're going to resolve this through budget cuts. We don't need PFD cuts. We don't need taxes." Well, we're going to resolve this through through budget cuts. It's been six years, folks. It hasn't happened. It's finally time to face up to it. We need to bring those people onto the playing field, and they need to say, okay, you, you legislature, you can't get this under control. Uh, we're going to need to pay for it somehow. We're paying for it right now through PFD cuts. We need to figure out if that's the right way. Uh, and if and once you bring them onto the field and you say the objective is to get the budget under control, you can see the PFD cut isn't doing it. I think the flat tax is the, is, is the right approach to do it. The threat of the flat tax, at least, the threat that we're going to tax all Alaskans equally in order to pay for these shenanigans, and then all Alaskans are going to start looking at uh, the cost of these programs, I think we need to bring the, those people onto the playing field. So I'm, I'm probably not going to make more friends. I'm probably going to lose a lot of friends by talking about this, but 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 we need to do it. I mean – the legislature, the legislature likes all these people being off to the sidelines, right? Right. They like all these people talk, talking amongst themselves about, oh, Matt, these budget cuts are going to do it. Because the legislature's just ignoring them, doesn't have to confront them, and just keeps on doing what it's doing. It keeps on – the Senate, look at the Senate, increasing the budget. They keep on uh, going down the road of PFD cuts, deeper and deeper PFD cuts. They, they want all these people off to the sidelines. So I think we need to engage that group that's gathered off to the sidelines said that uh, uh, magically budget cuts are going to do it. We need to bring them onto the playing field, and they need to start evaluating how we're going to pay for this. Um, And once they do that, once they confront the fact that, oh, my gosh, we're going to have to pay for this, um, then I think the pressure ups, particularly in in the top 20 percent, if we go to something like a flat tax, I think the pressure ups on the legislature to bring that spending down. I uh, but it was just thinking while you were talking, and I was thinking if the top, if the if the if the influence peddlers, if the top ten percent income earners are the ones that are kind of pulling the strings in a lot of ways with the legislature right now, boy howdy, is the discussion of a flat tax going to really really raise some eyebrows and uh, and and like you said, cause some consternation among that crowd. Um, it makes sense to me. Uh, I think it makes sense to a lot of people, but those people will not be happy about that. Um, and, uh, and, and we're going to have an uphill battle on that. No, sure we are. Sure we are. Because we're going to be facing not only that top 20%, but the people who are sitting off to the sidelines saying, oh no, budget cuts are going to somehow magically do this. We're going to elect a governor on a white horse. Right. uh, And he's going to somehow come in and magically do that. Not going to happen folks. I mean, just look at the Senate. Look at the promises they've made over the years, and then look at that budget sheet. Not going to happen. Um, and so we need to, you know, the definition of insanity is, is, is doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. Talking about budget cuts, solving uh, budget cuts alone, solving this ain't going to do it. I mean, that's, the, that's now the insane approach. We've been at this six years, ain't going to do it. We need to talk about a different way. 
Um, and frankly, people may challenge on a flat tax. Some people may say, oh, no, if we're, if we're going to gear at the top 20 percent, we need to go with a progressive income tax. That's the kind of conversation we need to have uh, or else we're just going to keep going down this road of, of each budget being bigger than the last budget. Uh, and just taking a little bit more. We just needed a little bit more of your PFD. That's what happened to the statutory budget reserve. That's what happened to the constitutional budget reserve. We just need a little bit more, a little bit more each year. And five years from now, you and I are going to be doing this program. Maybe me from a wheelchair, but you and I are going to be doing this program. <laughs> um, and and we're going to be saying, gosh, you remember five years ago when we said, you know, ah, 1,600 PFD. Well, well, and that will have gone that will have gone the way of the dodo bird, just like the SBR and the CBR did. We need to find a different way to do it. I think I think the threat of a flat tax, I think making all Alaskans pay for this, pay for what we're doing with government is the way to finally get government's attention. One final question. Uh, James in the chat room asks, oil and gas credit seems that Paul Seaton reinterpreted the income component to reduce the payout from one hundred and eighty four million to forty nine million. Your thoughts on that? No, it's. I mean, that's just another way of kicking the can down the road. Seton, see, <laughs> Paul sometimes has these different views of how statutes came about. Um, if you you can ask him about, uh, uh, oh, there's a an income tax, corporate income tax we have, but he's still fighting something like 20 years later. Um, that's his view of how the income tax came about because it enabled the House Finance Committee to pass a budget that was lower than it otherwise would if they would have complied with the statute. Everybody sort of climbed on board of it. That's not the way the statute has ever been interpreted in its 10 years. It's not the way it was sold in 2007 and 2008. It's not the way it was explained to producers for the last 10 years. It's not the basis on which the producers made these made these investments. It is wrong to sort of go back and reinvent the wheel on how we're going to interpret the statute now. We need to face up. We need to face up to that statute. We don't need to pay more in the statute, which is what the governor and the Senate wants to do, but we don't need to pay less than the statute. We need to live up to our statutory obligation. Brad Keithley, uh, you can find him at Alaskans for a sustainable budget. Uh, you can Google thoughts on oil and gas. You can find him on medium. He's prolific. He's everywhere. He's doing his thing. And uh, he's out there working, uh, working really hard for us. Uh, try to fight these battles, educate people, and we definitely appreciate him coming on the program this morning. Brad Keithley, thank you so much, my friend, for being part of the show today. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition from the, of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.